Hello and welcome to the booktube channel Jack in the Book Stack, where I talk about a wide variety of book genres and the bookish lifestyle. Today I have my October reading wrap up for you. If this is your first time tuning in to my booktube channel, well, what are you waiting for? Be sure that you hit the subscribe button down below. But in these monthly videos, I rank all the books that I read throughout the month from my least favorite to my most favorite and tell you a little bit of why. I categorize these in about four different ways so that there's chapters down below. You can hop around depending on if you want to see a rant or a rave, um, but I do unranked, disliked, liked, and loved. So I'm going to go ahead and just jump in. It has been a crazy month. I had a massive like sinus infection that made me really not want to read, but somehow I still ended up reading a lot of books. <laughs> I didn't do a lot of vlogs for them though because I had troubles like talking, my throat was really sore, so, uh, but I did read a lot. So let's dive in. Now one book I did not read a lot of is in the unranked category because I DNF'd it. Unfortunately that book was a sequel. It was Clown in the Cornfield 2 Friendo Lives. I started reading this and it had very much had a vibe of nobody believed what happened in book one, the slasher that happened to the high school kids of this small town, and that bugged me. It just didn't mesh with my mood, so I put it down. I might try it again at another time when I'm more tolerant of that trope, but October was not the time. The next book in the unranked category I did finish, but it doesn't really make sense to rate this in any certain way. That's because it was an audiobook for Pimsleur Spanish. This is the next level that I had to listen to, and it's hard to rank this in terms of enjoyment because it doesn't have a plot, it's teaching you Spanish. So it served its purpose. I really like the format of these books and the whole Pimsleur methodology but I don't like that it uses like the formal usted so much. I would like a little bit more informal using the to form or like other other forms uh, that I need to get practice conjugating. So still enjoy this. I mean I rated it four stars because I still rate it. It's just hard to rank it. Now let's jump to the disliked category. So the book that I liked the least in the month of October was Brother, a horror book written by Ania Alborn. I read this for a reading vlog I did this month on cannibalism and unfortunately the cannibalism didn't really kick in until like after 50% of the book. Mostly this had kind of like a family dynamic that was very abusive and that's primarily where the horror was and I didn't enjoy it. This is not my kind of horror. I think there's, I'm kind of picky with the tropes of my horror. This one just made me sad because our main character, what's his name, Michael I want to say? 19 year old Michael Morrow. He was just so sweet and he didn't want to do these horrible things that his family was making him do and they were so mean to him and it just made me sad. This wasn't a fun horror for me. I didn't enjoy the reading process and I'm actually just going to unhaul this book. A book that was slightly better than Brother was Hollow, a fantasy romance retelling of the legend of Sleepy Hollow written by Karina Hale. Man, I was so excited to read this Kindle Unlimited book. I love a retelling and The Legend of Sleepy Hollow is so good and there's so many creative things you can do with it. However, this is my second book by this author and I think she just might not be the author for me. I was just so bored. I was so bored. So the premise of this, we have the same characters from Sleepy Hollow in name, right? We have the, the female, we have Ichabod Crane, we have Brom, like we have the people. Um, but this is like a fantasy element where there's like a magical school for witches and Ichabod Crane is the teacher there, a girl's a student, and I just couldn't connect with this. I kind of dreaded picking it up actually. It was really tough for me to read, uh, so I did not enjoy it. The next book that I disliked in October, but it was slightly better than Hollow, was Cackle, a cozy witchy fantasy written by Rachel Harrison. Cackle has a premise that really appeals to me, even as I'm going to be telling you about it. So this is about our female main character. She is 30 years old and she is going through a breakup. She was dumped. She's devastated. She was with this guy for like 10 years. They live together. So she decides to move to a small town to start over and learn how to be single. And I love small town stories. 
love that. And I like the starting over element. So this seems very appealing to me. But our main character was one of the worst main characters I've ever read because she had no identity outside of this relationship. She was just so whiny. She couldn't do anything. She had this like self deprecating way where she's always putting herself down. And I get it. I get that it's done this way so that we see her development. But it was just too much. It was overwhelming. And she meets this other female that lives in the town. She's a little bit older and she's super elegant and refined and she's good at these different things like cooking. Like she's a really, really top-notch chef and like she makes her food and all this stuff and like people in the town kind of treat her kind of strangely though. Almost with fear. Um, but our main character just assumes that's because she has money. She owns a lot of the land. She's a lot of people's landlords. Well, I mean, you can kind of assume here. This takes like a witchy turn. There's some witchy elements to it. And I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that so you can experience it for yourself if you want to put yourself through it. But she is just such a nightmare. And I was reading it and I kind of was kind of waiting for like her to learn from her female friend how to be independent, how to enjoy the simple things in life. And eventually we did get there where she learns how to make like these really fancy meals. I can't remember if she was making like, making, like a risotto or like lamb chops or something, but she started to enjoy the single life and come into her own, but the focus was not as much on that as I needed it to be. I just, I couldn't stand her. Oh my gosh, she was insufferable. And to make it worse, she kept talking about how at 30 years old, she's a spinster. She's washed up, like she's over the hill. And I'm just like, girl, you have got to calm down. 30 is still so young. And I just had zero patience for this chick. The next book on this ranking I disliked, but not as passionately as those other ones. So let me tell you about it. A Discovery of Witches, a witchy fantasy written by Deborah Harkness. I am pretty disappointed that I ended up not enjoying this one because I have the whole series and I had the series on audiobook too. And I actually had to strategize getting all the books in October from Libby because there was a wait list. So I had to like be on hold and deliver later and kind of like strategize with it. I was really planning on reading the whole series this month. And it, I went into this expecting some dark academia, which I really like because we follow our female main character who works at a university. And I like that. I really dig that. And she's witchy and she has a love interest that's a vampire. And I was like, well, that sounds kind of intriguing. There's a lot of buzzwords here that made me intrigued in this book. Uh, unfortunately, this is another case where I just really did not enjoy the female main character. It was one of those situations where the chemistry was so awkward and so uncomfortable. I think she knows this guy for like two weeks or something. And she's already talking about, well, what if I want to spend my life with him? What's it like to become a vampire? And she's one of those like reckless who she's in a situation, a magical situation where she doesn't understand all the the politics and the intricacies of the magic and the different creatures because there's witches, vampires, demons. She doesn't understand all that's going on because she's always denied her attachment to like her witchiness and she just wants to be so reckless and she is just like well I don't care how dangerous it is I just want to be with him and he's like girl you are at risk you need to calm down you don't know what you're doing and he tries to keep her safe and she's just like a little she acts like a child, like a 16 year old who thinks they know everything. And this is a grown ass woman with a doctorate degree. And I'm just like, I'm so frustrated. So unfortunately I did not like this one. I think I'll still keep it. I'm not gonna unhaul this series yet. I wanna see if I can give us another try or at least going into book two, having the right expectations and being more tolerant. Sometimes that helps me, but we'll see. And maybe she matures. Maybe she matures in book two and throughout the series. I'm not optimistic though. We'll just, we'll have to play that one by ear. The top ranked book in the disliked category, it means that I disliked it the least because it's on the border of disliked and liked. That book is Alice, an updated retelling of Alice in Wonderland written by Christina Henry. I read Alice as part of a author taste test for Christina Henry. I did a video on it, trying out three of her books. Unfortunately, I did not enjoy this one. I don't necessarily have a problem with urban fantasy but maybe I do. I don't know. I kind of went into this knowing that it was more urban and I was expecting that kind of spin on the Alice in Wonderland tale, but it was just so loosely tied 
to the original source material that I didn't really enjoy it. Because we have Alice and presumably the Mad Hatter, I guess, and they're next door neighbors in a mental institution. And it's like a cell. And they get out of there, they break out. He is really haunted by the Jabberwocky. So that's something that's going on. And then they go out into the city, they're trying to escape, but then they have to conquer this Jabberwocky. They have this weird tension, romantic tension. He's kind of overprotective and controlling if you're into that kind of thing. And it didn't really play out well in this one. It was the chemistry of the characters, I think, that really I struggled with this. And then the creatures, the characters from Alice in Wonderland were like crime bosses, like mob bosses here. Like, and it was just strange. It didn't land with me and it might have been that urban fantasy element, but I don't want to say I don't like urban fantasy. It just didn't work for me in this case. And that's why it is in the disliked category. Now for some positivity. Let's talk about the books that I liked reading in the month of October. The first book on the list, meaning it's the one that I liked the least, but it's still in this category. It was The Forever Dog, Surprising New Science to Help Your Canine Companion Live Younger, Healthier, and Longer, a nonfiction by Rodney Habib and Dr. Karen Shaw Becker. This read is a little bit of a plot twist this month. I know it. It wasn't on any TBR. I've never mentioned it before. This one is available on Kindle Unlimited. I think I checked it out on my Kindle through Libby. But this kind of aligns with what I've been working on recently. If you saw my cannibalism reading vlog, you would have seen that I got, it, I got started making my own dog treats, like dehydrating dog treats and stuff. Well, that really took off this month and that was my favorite escape was uh, researching canine nutrition and learning about raw feeding my dogs. And I raw fed my previous dog because she was allergic to the preservatives and kibble. Um, so I already had like a basis. So really it's just like refreshing my memory kind of, but then learning how to make the food, how to balance it, really species appropriate diet, uh, raw or gently cooked. And so I've just been Man, I fell in a rabbit hole. I really, really did. So I read this book because I was looking for something that agreed with my beliefs. Uh, so it did that. And that's why it's in the liked category. I do feel like it was a little bit pretentious though. It was written to a much higher level, really focusing on the science and the ancestry of canines, like back to the wolves. And I didn't want that kind of focus. I wanted more real life, tangible facts, studies, information, actionable steps that you can take. And that didn't even happen to like chapter nine. And so it really took a long time. This book also did something I can't stand in nonfiction where it made up its own terms for things, like its own term and then its own abbreviation. And I actually wrote it down, but I, I lost it, but I wanted to tell you it was like CFM or something. It was some kind of abbreviation for the fresh food that you use as a kibble topper. Like, why do you need to make up your own term and then your own abbreviation for it? Just call it a topper. Like, it's insane. So it was a, it was really pretentious. And the valuable information I wanted from it was such a slim portion of the book. I do think this is good if you're curious about raw feeding and the benefits and some of the risks with the process, the super processed kibble that we typically feed dogs in commercial diets today. Um, some good information for a starting point. Uh, just be prepared that it does overwhelm you with a lot of like chemistry terms, science and studies and stuff and just be patient with it. Maybe skip ahead. Reading this on Kindle was great though because I liked highlighting things and then uh, sharing it with my boyfriend to convince him to raw feed our dogs. And uh, I did convince him, so yay. The next book that I liked in October was What Feasts at Night? A Whore written by T. King Fisher. This book is the sequel to What Moves the Dead. And in this one, we follow the same main character, Alex Easton, and it has another super spooky ambiance, super interesting background of the horror, like the legend that comes along with this. And Alex is returning to this hunting estate that um, they inherited from their family. And the caretaker has passed away mysteriously. And there's this like, there's spooky stuff that happens there. There's a legend, supernatural kind of element to it. I, I don't want to spoil too much because it is so short. Uh, but this legend of what haunts the grounds and kind of takes over. I don't know. This is really fun. And there's also a female character that joins Alex 
from book one that I really enjoy. She studies mushrooms like she's an expert on fungus and she's so quirky and fun and I adore her. So this was very atmospheric. I know I'm not telling you too much about the plot but again it's so short. Um, definitely I recommend reading book one first and I think I actually liked this one a little bit better. I enjoyed the story a little bit more. I liked the horror and the why behind it. So I did really enjoy What Feast at Night. The next book that I liked in October was Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, a thriller written by Stephen King. I adore the Shawshank Redemption movie. It is so good. And seeing how short the book was, it's 111 pages easy to squeeze in a busy reading month. Even though I was focused on horror, this thriller really fit the tone I was looking for. However, I would say this is one of the rare cases, very, very rare, that the movie is actually better. And I think because it's so short, you don't get a whole lot of character development. That's not the goal here. You don't see a lot of Andy Dufresne's intelligence. Um, Red is still our narrator. He's kind of like the old dog in the prison when the new kid comes to join and he's like narrating the experience. And a lot of it is like hearsay. Like he kind of speaks to you, the reader, um, telling you like, oh, I wasn't there, but I heard about this from the other inmates and yada yada. Um, so the plot follows the movie. Oh, sorry, that's the wrong way to say it. See, the movie is forefront in my mind. The plot from the movie follows the, the book very, very well. Very good adaptation. It's just, it has so much more character development that I enjoyed it so much more. Like the warden in the movie, ooh, you hate him. And you're like chilled to your bones of how like cruel he is. And the book, he's still cruel, but it's like you don't feel it the same way. So it was a really interesting experience. I was happy with how closely it followed, but I did miss that character development that you get from the movie. The next book that I liked was Near the Bone, a horror novel written by Christina Henry. I read this book for my Christina Henry author taste test and was very pleased with the result. I was optimistic I would like this one because it has an isolated cabin setting and it's snowy. And that is like my favorite for thriller horror books. This one really mixes real life horror of an abusive marriage, a very controlling husband, very physically abusive and verbally and emotionally, um, with a monster horror or a supernatural horror? You don't really know. All we know is we follow our main character. She lives in the woods, isolated cabin with her husband, and they see some weird things in the woods. Some violence that doesn't really align with like a bear or a mountain lion or any kind of like known animal. It's a little bit suspicious and intelligent. Very intelligent. So that's kind of the setting. So she is scared for a lot of different reasons. She's left in the cabin alone one day and there's a knock at the door. Two people are checking in because they're aware of a creature in the woods and they want to warn her and she wants to warn them to get the heck away before her husband gets home. Chaos ensues. It's a little bit of a survival story. Fast paced. Lots of twists and turns. It's gory. It's suspenseful. This was a satisfying, horrific good time. The next spooky season book that I enjoyed this month was Pinata, a horror book written by Leopoldo Gout. This is the kind of horror I really enjoy when it's built around culture and real life issues. That is something I really, really enjoy with my horror. There's like a deeper meaning to it. So this one takes um, a lot of inspiration from Mexican culture. And we follow our main character who is, I think she's like an, um, an architect. And she is sent by her firm in the US to Mexico. She takes her two daughters with her to design, to oversee this project. They are overhauling a church, a beautiful cathedral with a lot of dark history and converting it into a luxury hotel. And some stuff has taken place on this church before. <laughs> it's, it, like I said, it has a dark past. Uh, her daughter is one's a teenager and one I think is about eight years old. And she's super bubbly and outspoken, friendly to everybody. But that makes her a little bit of a risk because she's very open to all influences that might take over. This is a possession horror. 
very creepy. It was very like classical horror, like with a possession trope. And I really, I really enjoyed that. The thing that prevents us from being in the loved category is the mother was horrible. And I don't know if this is an issue of like a man writing a woman. I'm like, what kind of women have you known that you think that this is a good representation of motherhood? This mom was insane. She was so ridiculous. Okay, why are you bringing your two young girls to Mexico if you don't want them to be in Mexico? She would tell them like they have to remain in the house and lock the doors. Don't look out the windows. Don't go outside. Don't do anything. And, and she was always calling them, always asking, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Like super over the top. Like if you are that scared, and this is before the horror kicked in. This was just her being scared about everyday dangers in the, in the area, like missing girls and violence against women. If you were that worried, why did you take them? And she just makes a lot of really stupid emotional decisions. Someone comes to warn her and she's like, oh my God, why are you threatening me? Get out. <laughs> she is just very over dramatic, very over emotional. And I, again, I don't know where this representation of motherhood came from, but she was not really, she wasn't a good mom and she was an annoying character to read about. So I'm like, it, is that how you think this works, sir? The next book I enjoyed this month had a much more cozy feel to it. Stardust, a fantasy written by Neil Gaiman. Stardust was very whimsical and offered me a little bit of reprieve from the horrific books that I was reading because it was pretty charming. We follow our main character who is madly in love with the town beauty. She's gorgeous, everybody wants her, and they see a falling star one day and he says, hey, if I get that falling star for you, she actually might ask him, if he gets this fallen star for her, then she will do whatever he wants. Like she'll marry him. And so he's, yes, yes, ma'am, I will go get that for you. So he goes off to find the fallen star, but the fallen star is actually a, like a person, like a young woman. And so it's kind of like an adventure from there because he is not the only one looking for the fallen star. So danger lurks. This was just, it was a very good escape read. It was charming, it was whimsical, it was fun. I had a good time reading Stardust. We are at the top of the list. It is time for the book that I liked the most in October. Blackwater, a literary horror collection written by Michael McDowell. This was such an all-consuming read. And I'm having a hard time explaining this book. I've actually tried to some of my in real life friends and family to talk about this book and it's so difficult because I don't know who to recommend this one to. It is a generational story. We follow the Kasky family over the course of 50 years. So several generations of this family and they are in a small town in Alabama and there is a river that flows through and often it overflows and it floods and it wipes away everything in the town. At the very beginning, we come in right when everything's flooded and there is a new addition to the town, Eleanor. And so she arrives under very mysterious circumstances during this flood and she kind of like interacts with the family. This is the story of the interactions over the course of 50 years. This was so good because it was very consuming to just be a part of this family, understand them through and through. The character work was so intricate. But to tell you the core of what this book is about is the family interactions, their squabbles, their dramas, their relationships. That doesn't even do it justice. Like if someone told me that, I'd be like, well, that sounds kind of boring. My family has its own drama. Why do I want to read about someone else's? But it was so interesting how they all got along or didn't get along or controlled or manipulated each other. And then there's this, like, not random, but there's this underlying plot and tone that has to do with horror. And so there's just these random horrific moments with sea monsters or like water monsters. And there's like violence and some gore and just some interesting creature aspects but I can't lead with that in the description because that's not the primary plot of the book it's just kind of like this subplot that makes it really really interesting I 
really enjoyed this. Like I said, all consuming. I feel like I know this family through and through. I'm almost sad it's over. I really enjoyed reading this. I savored it. I read it throughout the whole month. This is the collection of all the short books. So these are, this is a series of novellas. I think there's six. And this is a collection of all of them. So you could break it up into, into parts. But oh my gosh, this is so interesting. Like I want an update. I want to know where the Kasky family is today. Now it's time for my favorite part of every monthly ranking video. It's time to talk about the books that I loved this month. The lowest ranked book that I loved reading this month was The Graveyard Book, a fantasy novel written by Neil Gaiman. Yes, this was my second Neil Gaiman book this month. And this has been on my shelf for a while. I kind of struggle with him because some allegations have been made against him that make me think he might not be the best of human beings. And I think that we should believe women's stories. And so I want to believe them. I want to believe the victims. On the other hand, cancel culture can be a little bit extreme. And I don't want to just jump on the bandwagon if it's popular to cancel someone. Um, so I really, really struggle with these kinds of situations. How do you separate a monster from their art? And then also knowing that the monster in question is writing like a middle grade book for kids that does make me feel a little bit icky. And even when it comes to the other book I read from him, Stardust, I had this in the back of my mind and it did influence my read because there was like random, there was like a random sex scene that didn't make sense for the tone of the book. And then he described one of the female characters as having like high perky breasts and a bright smile or bright eyes or something like that. I'm not quoting exactly, but it was something like, why do you need to describe her breasts when you're describing her eyes? Like, you don't need that description. And it's hard because the allegations against him are just like in my head when I'm reading these things and I have a tough time separating. In short, I don't know how I feel about Neil Gaiman as a human. I don't know how I'm going to move forward as a reader when it comes to his work. I don't know. And I, I'm like, I've mentioned it because I think it is important to know who we're supporting. Um, I don't know where I stand. I am aware. I just, I don't know what to do with the information. So when it comes to Graveyard Book, it was hard. It was hard to separate what I know about him versus this book. I think I really enjoyed it though. Even though again it creeps me out that this is like a middle grade book written by someone who has these allegations against him. Ugh. Ugh. Difficult. Okay. Anyways, I liked this. So this starts off with a very horrific scene of someone unaliving an entire family except for one. This baby gets away. This baby finds himself in a graveyard and the ghosts that live in the graveyard decide to take him in, keep him safe. So he grows up in this graveyard and he can see all the ghosts. He has full range of this whole graveyard and all the mystical things that happen there. And he struggles with, he kind of just wants to be a kid and, and go to school and have friends, but he is in danger. And then he is very different because he grows up with all these ghosts that have like all this, all this historical knowledge and everything. And it had such a cozy vibe and it was perfect for spooky season without being scary because it has plenty of ghosts. It has this thrilling aspect of this serial killer that wants to unalive him, it has these magical aspects. So it just made me feel good. Uh, the ending was not as satisfying as I wanted it to be. It wasn't bad. It just didn't tie up as nice as, as I would have liked. Um, but I still really enjoyed reading this book and I can definitely see myself rereading this. The next book that I loved reading was Horseman, A Tale of Sleepy Hollow, a horror retelling of the legend of Sleepy Hollow written by Christina Henry. This is the third book that I read for my Christina Henry author taste test video. I love this book. Again, I mentioned with another Sleepy Hollow retelling that I read, I like the source material so much. I like the creative spin on it. And this one was really, really fun. This takes place 30 years after the, the events in that story. So it's not a retelling of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. It has the same characters, but it has different explanations for what happened 30 years ago. And we follow the grandchild of Brom and we follow them as violent things start happening in the town of Sleepy Hollow yet again. Is it the horsemen? Did the horsemen really exist? Was that like a joke on people? You don't know. Ne neither does the town. They don't know. But like, D 
decapitated bodies without hands or feet that decay really strangely. These are the kinds of things that are happening. And so our main character stumbles upon that and tries to figure it out. Brahm is such a cool character in this. I don't like him in the original one because you're supposed to be like on the side of Ichabod Crane and Brahm is like the competition, but I really liked Brahm. The next book that I loved was Alive, The Story of the Andes Survivors, a nonfiction written by Pierce Paul Reed. I read this nonfiction for my vlog reading cannibal books. If you have not seen that video, I will link it for you. Please check it out because I was thrilled how that video turned out. Thrilled, which then disturbs me that I'm thrilled about cannibalism. But this nonfiction story, I had never heard of this event, which is okay, that's embarrassing. That's embarrassing. I should have better awareness than that. Uh, but this is about a, a rugby team and they, among others, were on a plane that crashed in the Andes Mountains. Very snowy, very ugh, unfriendly circumstances, and they had to survive. So this is a survival story. And uh, spoiler alert, they had to resort to cannibalism to survive. Oh, this was such a cool story. I actually really want to watch the movie. I hear there's like an adaptation on Netflix or something. I did not like the writing style of the book. Like, right in the beginning they lay out all the events for you. They lay out how many people crashed versus how many survived and for how many days. And so it almost kind of spoiled the story for me. So when I was reading it, because I hadn't heard of this before, when I was reading this I was like, oh well I know this attempt for escape is not going to work because we're not at that date threshold mentioned on page one. So that really ruined the experience for me. Um, I also think this could have been nice if it had a little bit more of like a fiction writing style with like dialogue and descriptions. Like the detached writing style of the nonfiction didn't really do the story justice. It's just so suspenseful in its nature, how it is. I think it could have been written a little bit differently, but really loved the story. I was really captivated by it. I cannot imagine. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. This was wild. The next book that I loved was A Sorceress Comes to Call, a horror fantasy written by T. King Fisher. This is T. King Fisher's latest release. She is one of my favorite authors, so I was so happy to pick this one up through Libby, and I loved it. Okay, so the main female character is a little bit annoying, but she really is a victim here. She is controlled by her mother, literally. Her mother is a sorceress and has the ability to take over her body and control her actions. So like the opening scene, they're sitting at church and her mom is making her stay, like sit completely still, even as like a fly crawls across her skin. Like she's not allowed to move or do anything. Very scary concept. So this has depth to it because it's a horror story where the horror is kind of real life. And that is a toxic parent relationship, a controlling relationship, not seeing a way for escape. And so there's elements of like real life horror along with this fantasy horror of this sorceress who her main goal is to get a rich husband. So they go and have the target picked out, but he has a sister who becomes really good friends with our female main character and wants to help her out. So this was fun fun, gruesome. It was truly a mix of fantasy and horror, like 50-50. I, I have a hard time describing this, like what genre it fits into, but I think horror is a little bit better because it is a little bit graphic at times. I was pretty terrified of a horse. Yeah, it definitely all plays a factor. The next book is a complete 180 when it comes to the vibes. I'm talking about Somewhere Beyond the Sea, A Cozy Fantasy by T.J. Klune. Oh, you guys, T.J. Klune just makes me feel so good. And I was so happy to return to this world with these characters. This is the sequel to The House on the Cerulean Sea. And we have magical orphans who are under the care of their adopted father. Like saying headmaster is not appropriate. But it's just a great found family vibe as we have our two lovebirds that are taking care of all these kids that are just rejected by society. And so this one, we follow them all again. And it's a lot of the same problems that the world just doesn't want to accept them. They're scared of them. They're scared of their potential. Just like Lucy, who is uh, the son of the Antichrist. And he's just a cool kid who loves music. And like the world doesn't want to let him be because they're so scared of him. 
And it's just so beautiful. The messages of acceptance and tolerance and patience and there's humor and the way they stand up for each other is just so beautiful. I really love TJ Klune. He never fails to make me smile and just my heart is warmed. We're gonna do a 180 on the tone and the vibes again. But hey, October, spooky season, it's bound to happen. The next book that I loved reading and actually the runner up for my favorite book was a Certain Hunger, a literary horror written by Chelsea G. Summers. This was such an intelligent horror and it had a sarcastic tone that I loved. And reading it, it was so rich and beautifully written that I wanted to highlight things and like take quotes away. But it was one of those where, you know, it made such an impact on me while I was reading it. I don't know if taking the quote away would have an impact to anyone else or like out of context. It was just so beautifully written and it's so weird to say that I read this as part of my cannibal horror reading vlog <laughs> because this is about a cannibal and she is a food critic which I love and I'm so confused because I was so hungry reading this and hearing her descriptions of food and like really fancy food that I've never had before. I love description of food in books. But then when she starts getting into cannibalism, it gets weird because she takes the care and attention and respect she has for food and flavors in her food critic career, she brings to her cannibalism. And so I'm like, why does this sound delicious right now? <laughs> like, Why am I thinking about a wine pairing with like a human liver? I, what is going on with me right now? <laughs> but this was so good. And I checked this out through Libby. I think I read it on my ki my Kindle and I need a copy of this. I need to buy it because I love this so much. I could really see myself rereading this. It was exactly what I like in my horror being that intelligence. A lot of um, commentary on like feminism and women as they age and um, sexuality because their main character is very very sexual. There's just so much. So commentary on that. Intelligent. Intelligent in her actions and just her views on life and it's literary so at times she goes off into like her views on things which I just found really intriguing. I I love this. Intelligent, well written, smart, gross, horrific and made my stomach growl which is again disturbing. When it comes to my favorite read for October 2024, no surprise that it was a disturbing horror. The book was The Eyes Are the Best Part. This is a horror by Monica Kim. This also follows what I was saying with I like intelligent horror, I like cultural references. This has a lot of commentary on Asian fetishization and I like that spin on it. We have a family with a mother and her two daughters. They're dealing with the aftermath of the dad walking out and that's kind of heartbreaking and difficult but they're dealing with it. Um, and our main character starts getting an obsession with eyeballs. Her mom's new boyfriend just has the most beautiful blue eyes and they're haunting her in a disturbing way. So this is about cannibalism. Um, as she starts diving into the cannibalism, gosh, the descriptions on the texture. Yeah, that's gross. That's disturbing. The ending was very, very satisfying. I enjoyed the direction that this went. Very much a good for her kind of horror. And I enjoyed it. It was thought provoking. It was disturbing. It was gross. All the things I loved. Uh, this was my favorite read of the month. So that's it. That's all the books that I read for spooky season 2024. I'm not burnt out yet on the horror. I think I had a good mix of the disturbing and the cozy and the thought provoking. So it was very, very wildly successful. This was a great reading month. Thank you so much for hanging out with me in this video. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Thank you.